why do we have feelings? Ah. Imagine when we went home from school one day and there was a nice warm delicious pie waiting for you. It would make you happy, right? Now imagine, you went home from a bad day at school, knowing there was to be a delicious hot pie waiting for you, only to find out there is no pie. How would you feel? Probably quite sad and disappointed, right? Happiness, contentment, love, bitterness, worry are some of the many feelings we have. To understand why we have feelings, we must first understand what are feelings. Feelings are mental associations and reactions to an emotion. They are colored by our personal experiences and beliefs. Wait a minute, aren't feelings and emotions the same? Well, they are many times used interchangeably, so one might think they are the same. But the truth is that they are different. Emotions are involuntary bodily responses. Like when you go to school and come to know there is a surprise test. Your pulse increases and you feel uneasy in your stomach. On the other hand, feelings make you aware of your emotions. So feelings arise out of the narrative we give to the emotion. To understand this better, imagine you're sleeping peacefully at night and suddenly you hear a loud knock on your bedroom door. You will instantly experience fear and your heart will beat faster. You might break into sweat. While describing the incident to someone, you will describe it as, I felt terrified. It was really scary. To imagine there might be an imposter in the house. I felt a sense of panic, terrified, scared, panic stricken are all feelings that are extensions of the basic emotion of fear. So one might wonder why do we have these feelings? Isn't life complicated enough with so many emotions? Well, feelings might sometimes seem like a burden when they grow intense like the feeling of grief or distress when you lose or break your favorite toy or when your beloved pet gets hurt. But feelings are important, as without them, we wouldn't have been able to build and accomplish our goals. Without care, wonder, expectation and a sense of pride, we wouldn't have developed as a society. Even animals have emotions. Think about a deer caught in headlines. It does experience fear, but it stops there. There is no feeling of horror, as animals don't have the symbolism of language and the sense to rationalize to turn that emotion into a feeling. So, if we didn't have feelings, we would be no different from animals. It is the ability to reason about the past and future and to have feelings that give way to action that has allowed us to dominate the food chain. It has helped us shape the world for our future through inventions and discoveries and the will to survive. So, the next time you feel distressed or perplexed, know that the feeling is what makes you human and it will eventually pass. Evolution of Language Language developed as the human species evolved. Development of language sets us apart from our closest relatives, the chimpanzees. No other natural communication system is like human language. Human language can express thoughts, convey information, ask questions and give orders. In contrast, animals can only communicate immediate issues such as food, danger, threat or reconciliation. So how did language begin? Did a bunch of cavemen hold a conference and decide to make up language? Obviously not. One theory is that hominids, our human ancestors, started grunting, hooting and crying out. And this gradually developed into the language we use today. But apes could grunt and hoot as well. 
Why did their grunting not evolve into a language? Because six million years ago, the hominid and chimpanzee lines diverged. The size of the hominid brain increased and developed over time, while chimpanzee brain remained the same. Another theory is that language began as sign language and then switched to vocal modality. Some have also argued that language evolved independently in different parts of the world. However, a recent study shows that all languages in the world evolved from one prehistoric language first spoken in Africa tens of thousands of years ago and then spread across the world with the migration of our ancestors when they left Africa 70,000 years ago. So, do languages stay the same over the generations? Languages change as they are handed down from generation to generation due to change in culture and influence of other languages. That is why the English spoken in the Elizabethan era is way different from the English we speak today. The subject of language and its evolution is still undergoing lively investigation among linguists, psychologists and biologists. How can we measure beauty? To understand if beauty is measurable, let us first understand the terms measure and beauty. Measurement means to define something in a clear and precise way. Beauty refers to the quality of being pleasing, especially to look at. The debate on what makes something or someone beautiful has been going on for centuries. This was the time when it was believed that proportionate and symmetrical objects were more attractive. The earliest Western theory of beauty can be found in the works of Greek philosopher Pythagoras, who saw a strong connection between mathematics and beauty. The definition is still held as relevant by many. So in that manner, we can say that beauty can be measured. The question then arises of whether beauty is universal. The painting of Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci is considered beautiful. And so is Van Gogh's sunflowers. What do they have in common? What makes them so beautiful despite the lack of symmetry here? The Taj Mahal is considered beautiful and so is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. What element that could describe beauty is common here? In this case, it definitely cannot be measured by math. A combination of qualities such as shape, color or form, arrangement that pleases the senses, be it sight or sound, makes something beautiful. It is also found that people around the world find different music, visual art, performance and physical attributes to be beautiful. It's on the basis of those considerations that many believe that beauty is a label we attach to different sorts of experiences based on combination of culture and personal preferences. So the saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, used to express the fact that not all people have the same opinions, but what is attractive and pleasing holds true. Stay warm. Hmm, it's such a nice day today. I thought I would teach you how to build an igloo. Igloo? How can an igloo that is made up of ice keep us warm? <laughs> we aren't using frozen blocks of ice to build the igloo. Those are too heavy for us to pick up. What do we use instead? We use snow, which has been blown by the wind, as it has interlocked pieces of ice crystals in it. It can be cut into blocks and used as bricks for our igloo. But you still haven't told me how something cold will keep me warm. Using our blocks of snow, we create a dome-like shape 
with a small entrance which connects to the igloo with a tunnel. It is at a right angle which stops any direct cold wind from entering. Mm, but where do we sleep inside? Ah, oh, I'm still confused. An igloo stays warm inside with the help of the warmth from our bodies. The more people that are in an igloo, the warmer it will be. The body heat radiating from us is insulated within the igloo and keeps circulating inside. The compressed snow we used to build the igloo is a good insulator and keeps the heat trapped. We also build many levels inside the igloo to help us stay even warmer. The first level is where we build the fire and above it is the second level where we sleep. The air heated up with the fire rises to the second level to keep us warm. all the time Who decided a year should have 12 months People across the world follow the Gregorian calendar The world converted to the Gregorian calendar in 1752 Otherwise different people around the world follow different calendars In fact People who do agriculture and farming still use a combination of solar and lunar calendars. The 12 months in the calendar as we know them today were first introduced by Julius Caesar in the year 45 BC on January 1st. So why did the calendar change? The calendar used previously consisted of 10 months. but it couldn't account for the cyclic revolution of the earth around the sun which takes exactly 365.2422 days the 10 month calendar the previous roman calendar began the year in march and ended it in december it has been in use from 753 bc by romulus the legendary first king of rome The calendar was later modified because it accounted for only 304 days in a year. So, what happened to the leftover 61 days? The second king of Rome, Numa Pompilius, added 2 months at the end of the calendar, Lanuarius and Februarius, to account for the missing days. He also introduced an intercalary month that occurred after february in certain years these years became known as leap years in addition he deleted one day from all the months that had 30 days so that they had 29 days instead around for 700 years this resulted in a total of 355 days in a common year and 377 days in a leap year the leap years were declared at the whim of the king although unstable the calendar was in use for 700 years but it got very confusing because seasons and calendars did not match it played havoc with the farmers so julius caesar in 45 bc under the guidance of his astronomers decided to alter the calendar and make it more stable finally the seasons had a chance to catch up for 16 centuries so when did we switch to the gregorian calendar we use today the same calendar had been used since then till 1752 when the gregorian calendar was adopted all over the world to synchronize it to the english and american colonies the world and its boundaries had expanded quite a bit from caesar's times the gregorian calendar fixed the julian calendar era of calculating one revolution of earth around the sun to take 365.2422 days into account 
So, there you have it. It was originally Julius Caesar who initiated the 12 months we have in the calendar today. Do fish sleep? Imagine a fish swims all day long. It must get really tired and probably just wants to have a shut eye. But how? Most fish have no eyelids. Eyelids help terrestrial animals mm. keep their eyes moist. But since fish are always underwater, they do not need eyelids to help keep their eyes moist. So, it's really difficult for us to make out if they are sleeping or not. So, if fish don't have eyelids, does this mean they do not sleep? Almost all fish sleep. Though some zebrafish are insomniacs, which means they have trouble sleeping. Do fish lay down to sleep like other animals? Since fish live in an environment unlike ours, laying down and sleeping like humans can be dangerous. They rest their brains in parts at different times and are never completely unconscious. How do fish sleep? Some fish, like the shark, keep swimming in their sleep. Tuna fish rest motionless at night, suspended in the water. Bass or perch will sleep under or on top of logs. Reef fish seek refuge in crevices. Parrotfish build a cocoon of mucus in which to sleep. Why is sleep and resting our body so important? If we do not sleep properly, we will always be tired, cranky and unhappy. This is because when we sleep, the body also gets a chance to clean itself of waste and other byproducts of cell functions within our bodies. So, fish also need to sleep so that they can repair their cells and also conserve their energy. What exactly are dragons? Stories of dragons have existed since the time stories were told. Dragons generally are said to have wings, scales and claws and breathe fire. They are also thought to be majestic creatures of mystery and magic. Different cultures have varying stories. The Europeans early on thought of them as sea creatures and had maps depicting them waiting to eat unsuspecting sailors at the edge of the earth. Generally, the dragons were thought of as bringers of destruction and terror, often depicting them as hoarders of treasure or maidens or both. At the other side of the planet, the Japanese, Koreans, Chinese revered and worshipped them as mythical creatures who brought wisdom, prosperity and good luck. Japanese ones are water deities and celestial beings associated with rainfall and bodies of water and are typically depicted as large, wingless, serpentine creatures with clawed feet. Chinese dragons traditionally symbolize potent and auspicious powers, particularly control over water, rainfall, typhoons and floods has there been proof that dragons existed? Well, ancient people may have discovered dinosaur fossils and understandably misinterpreted them as the remains of dragons. Chang Ku, a Chinese historian from the 4th century BC, mislabeled such a fossil and gave credibility to the myth of dragons. A stegosaurus was a giant beast, 30 feet in length and typically 14 feet tall and 
was covered in armored plates and spikes for defense. Even in a small town of Austria, they mistook the skeleton of the ancient rhino and called it dragons. A statue of a dragon still stands in the middle of the town square. Humans usually try to find meaning in things they can't explain. The closest thing we can call to actual dragons is the Commodore dragon. Not entirely a dragon, but fearsome anyway. So we know that the dragons are fictional, but as they say, there is no smoke without fire. How does a bicycle stay upright? If you get on a bicycle and start pedaling, what do you feel? You will feel the movement of the bicycle as you move forward. Doesn't it fill you with surprise that you can move forward on two wheels just by pedaling your way? Let's see what happens when a stationary bicycle is pushed without a rider. The pushed bicycle keeps moving. It's becoming slower. And now it has fallen. A moving bicycle will continue to stay upright and move forward because of momentum till it falls down because of gravity. Did you know that till a few decades back, scientists thought a bicycle stays upright because of the gyroscopic effect? The gyroscopic effect means that a spinning wheel tends to stay aligned in its original direction during momentum. This is known as angular momentum or spinning action. So if it is not the gyroscopic effect, what actually keeps the bicycle upright? The scientists who study bicycle experimented a bit more to discover that if the gyroscopic effect were to be cancelled, the bicycle would continue to be upright. So they assumed it must be the caster effect of the wheels because the bicycle wheels are attached to a center axis on a frame to help them rotate. What is the caster effect's role in keeping bicycles upright? If you look at a bicycle, you will see that it is designed in such a way that the front wheel's steering axis makes the front wheel move faster than the back wheel. So, when the bicycle starts moving to the left, the centrifugal force of the back wheel would keep it in check because it is still moving straight. The wheel would automatically snap the bike to the right and keep it upright. So, now you know that angular momentum and centrifugal force keeps a bicycle upright when it is moving. Why do food smell? Have you ever wondered why food smells so terrible sometimes? Do you think it's because of sweat? Well, think again. Sweat is actually odorless because it is made up of water and salt. But then how can that produce a bad smell? Confused? Let's see what happens exactly. You can blame bacteria for your stinky feet. This process takes place when sweat is produced and conditions are favorable for bacteria. Bacteria love to eat dead skin and drink sweat. As bacteria eat these, they produce a byproduct which is made up of certain chemical compounds which really smell very bad. In short, the smell is produced due to bacterial poop. Gross, but interesting, right? That should help you understand where the bad smell comes from. But then why do only your feet stink and not your whole body? 
it is because your feet have more sweat glands than the rest of your body. A pair of feet have about 250,000 sweat glands that make up about one cup of sweat every day. That means your feet produce more sweat than the rest of your body. In case of the whole body, sweat can diffuse more easily than your feet. Your feet work very hard for you and for the maximum time are covered with different layers like socks and shoes which become the best home for bacteria to do their job. So, no matter how hygienic and clean you are, your feet will stink when you cover them for a long time. Sad but true. Why is the sea salty? Do you know where I can get some fish? This sea doesn't seem to have any. Don't you know you're at the Dead Sea? The water is so salty that no fish or plants can live in it. Hmm, I was wondering why there were no fish to eat. I've always wondered though, why are the seas and oceans so salty? All this actually begins with rain. Rainwater contains a little carbon dioxide absorbed from the surrounding air, making it slightly acidic in nature. What? Acidic? But I drink that water! It is only slightly acidic. It may not affect us. But when it rains down on rocks, it erodes them. All this erosion eventually ends up in our seas and oceans. This process creates electrically charged atoms, also known as ions. The two main ions created are chloride and sodium, and these are salty. Oh, I know sodium. It's in the salt we eat. But how does all this rainwater end up in our oceans and seas? Ah, that's where rivers and streams are very important. Rainwater runs off into streams and rivers which eventually lead to the sea. Rivers are not as salty as the sea as they deposit all of the dissolved salts into the seas and oceans on a regular basis. But water from oceans and seas also evaporates. Shouldn't that make them less salty? Evaporation makes seas saltier. Fresh water evaporates leaving salt and dissolved minerals behind. It has taken millions of years of salt deposits and evaporation to make seas and oceans as salty as they are today. Most oceans and seas have rivers which flow out, carrying some of the salt with them. The Dead Sea has no rivers to remove salt, and because of that, it's even saltier than other oceans and seas. Whoa! I better go find another place to catch my lunch! <laughs>